Welcome everyone to today's virtual digital economy seminar. It's again a pleasure to welcome all of you and uh, again to have a very exciting talk upcoming and a very uh, fantastic speaker uh, uh, as a guest today. Our moderator will be Daniel Ershoff at the Toulouse School of Economics and he will introduce our speaker momentarily. Um, if you have any clarifying questions throughout the talk, please send these to Daniel in the chat window. He'll unmute you so you can ask your question in person. So I think one or two, uh, so Matt and Chow, the co-authors might be around in the chat. So uh, maybe they can they can also take some of the clarifying questions while, while uh, Kozuki is presenting. Um, and if you prefer, you can also ask Daniel to ask the question for you if you don't want to ask it yourself. Um, we will also collect questions for the Q&A after the talk in the same way. So don't hesitate to send questions uh, to Daniel. And as always, the session will be recorded and we will make it available on YouTube afterwards. So if you ask a question yourself, you will appear in that recording. All right, so I'm very happy to hand over to Daniel. Great, thanks, Anis. Uh, yes, yeah, so today we're, uh, thanks a lot for coming again to, to this uh, seminar. Today, we're very happy to have Kasuko Otake from the Yale School of Management uh, to talk to us about attention and intention to baseball telecasts. And this is gonna be a paper about uh, suspense and surprise as well. So I hope there's going to be many suspenseful and surprising things in the paper that will uh, maintain our attention. Uh, and so, Kasuke, let me just uh, hand you over the microphone. All right. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you for having me to the great uh, webinar series. Uh, it is my pleasure to share our uh, recent research with my uh, great co-authors, uh, Shao at NYU Starin uh, and Matt at Caltech, I believe. I see shells here. I'm not sure Matt is around, but I believe uh, both of them are around. So if you have any tough questions, please ask to them. Uh, I'm going to handle easy questions. Okay. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, let me begin. So the motivation of this paper uh, is that the media entertainment is an important part of our life, and especially watching TVs. And even though I, you know, we have smartphones and tablets still, watching TV is an important part of our life. Right? This is this table, this is American Time Use Survey in 2018, and this says about like 20% of our waking time is spent for watching TV. So that's a lot of time. So if you look at men that are watching TV, that's like on average three hours a day. For female, that's like 2.6 hours a day. So that's a lot of time. Okay? So we spend a lot of time for watching TV and you know, during this COVID-19 pandemic, we spend even more time for watching TV, right? Because we need to stay at home. So uh, a recent study by Nielsen uh, report that says uh, streaming TV content nearly doubled uh, the level of last year. And so the table below here, this is a Japanese data, uh, but this table shows the change in the time spent uh, for watching TV before and after the lockdown. So in Japan, it was March 2020. Um, so across all you know, age groups on x-axis and across time of day, we see an uh, increase in time for watching TV. Right? Uh, so the blue, blue bars all increasing uh, time. Um, teenagers is kind of interesting. Right? On average, they increase the time for watching TV, uh, but they spend much less uh, in the early morning between 6 and 9 a.m., but they spent much more uh, for watching TV between 2 to 6 a.m. So kids and teenagers, they go to bed late and they wake up late. Right? So, uh, but on average, uh, what I want to emphasize here is that people spend more time for watching TV during this COVID-19 pandemic. So I think uh, still it is important to understand the TV watching behavior. What are the driving forces? Uh, to increase customer engagement for TV contents. So what, what are, oh, how does the TV program content affect the TV watching behavior and that engagement to TV programs? Those are uh, still important questions to ask. So you know, when we are thinking about how TV program contents affect our engagement to TV programs, and I think uh, the presidential election that we have a month ago uh, was a kind of interesting motivating example for our research, uh, because when I was watching, you know, the election results last month, I was I was uh, like this, <laughs> right? Because, you know, waiting for the results in some states is very suspenseful. Like we don't know the results until the you know, week after. 
uh, but waiting for the results of some states, like if the some states were flipped, those events are kind of surprising. So when I was watching this election result, it was a kind of series of suspenseful and surprising moments. And that increases our engagement to the TV programs. Right? So actually in the literature, in the literature, suspense and a surprise are a key driving forces to increase customer engagement to TV viewing across all genres, across all categories. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the theory uh, in detail, but there are a bunch of theories that identify, jointly identify suspense and surprise are an important part of our customer engagement okay, to the TV programs. So for this study in particular, we're gonna focus on suspense and surprise because uh, those are kind of common uh, driving forces across categories and especially important for our specific context that uh, I'm gonna work out. That's the baseball games. So the sports events, I think suspense and surprise are uh, very important to uh, increase customer attention and viewing. Okay. So suspense, this is a feeling of excitement or anxiety while waiting for something uncertain to happen. Uh, but surprise is something unexpected or a feeling that is caused by some surprising events. Okay. So we're gonna focus on those suspense and surprise as the TV kind of contents or features and how does suspense and surprise affect the TV watching behavior. So the research question we are asking in this paper is how should the TV, planner, TV, TV program planner design programs so that they can change suspense and surprise in a program uh, to TV viewers. So by designing uh, appropriate TV program contents they can change suspense and surprise in the programs that drive the customer engage engagement to TV programs. So how should we do that? That's the question. Uh, so this is a product design question. Uh, TV program designers, uh, you know, by, you know, by changing the program contents, they can change and surprise and sub suspense in the program that affect the customer viewing behavior. So they want to maximize customer welfare. They want to maximize the number of uh, eyeballs or uh, customer engagement by designing the program contents. Okay. And also this is relevant for advertisers because the question is, you know, when is the best timing or you know, uh, good timing to have commercials or advertisements? Should we have commercials during the suspenseful moment or should we have commercials during su surprising moments? Okay. You know, in general, advertisements and commercials are interrupting watching behavior. Uh, so in a suspenseful moment, people are actively paying attention to the screen, but all of a sudden commercial starts, then people's engagement or people's attention might get disrupted. Right? People might start watching different uh, channels, for example. Right? So uh, when do we have, when should we have commercials and advertisements during the program? That's an important question for advertisers as well. Okay, so that's another question we are asking in this paper. And the specific context we are studying in this paper is baseball game, professional baseball games in Japan. Uh, so rephrasing the questions above, we're gonna ask the following two questions in this paper. How can we improve the rules of baseball games? So we're gonna focus on the professional baseball game programs. So the program contents, uh, basically the rules of baseball games. Okay. And the Major League Baseball game is currently actively discussing several rule changes. Some of them were already uh, implemented, uh, but through the kind of factual simulations, we can simulate how the customer's viewing behavior are going to be affected when we change the rules of baseball games. So for example, if we shorten a game from nine innings to seven innings, nine innings is just too long, so let's shorten the game from nine innings to seven innings. How does that impact the people's viewing behavior? Or uh, what if we start a mercy roll? So uh, if one team outscores another team by like seven points by the end of like six, six innings, the game is going to end. If we start a mercy roll, how does that affect the customer engagement and what's the implication for that for advertisers? So that's the question uh, we can do. And also we're gonna ask, uh, when is optimal timing, good timing to have commercials? Should we have more commercials in like nice innings with bases fully loaded, like the suspenseful moment, or should we have more commercials in the first inning uh, when nobody is on the base? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you have if you have time to go through all of the results, 
uh, some of the results are still ongoing. We don't have the results yet, uh, but uh, I hope we can uh, get to the results. Okay, so those are the kind of questions we are asking uh, in this paper. Uh, related literature, I'm not going to talk about the most of them, uh, but uh, there is a growing literature uh, in the second bullet point. There is a growing literature uh, looking at suspense and surprise. And they are mainly also focusing on sports events like soccer, uh, tennis, things like that. Uh, but most of the existing papers are looking at kind of aggregate data of viewing behavior. Okay. Uh, and as I will show in a few slides, we have a better measurement of customer engagement, individual level customer engagement um, that allows us to uh, uh, dive into the detailed questions about product designs. Right, so I think the key contributions of this paper uh, is, first of all, we want to highlight the difference between viewing and attention. Like I said, we have a better measurement of customer engagement, that's the difference between viewing and attention. The viewing is more in you know, a passive way of viewing, uh, watching TV, and attention is a more active way of watching TV. So viewing, uh, TV is on, I'm sitting in front of TV, uh, but maybe I'm looking at my tablet or smartphone. So this is a more passive way of watching TV. That's viewing. And attention is a more active way. I'm actually actively paying attention to the screen. Okay. And we highlight that that's a difference. Okay. Viewing and attention are different. And a suspense and surprise, the program features and contents affect differently to viewing and attention. Okay. So the, to the extent that attention is more precise measure of customer engagement than viewing, our results have some implications for TV program designers and also advertisers. Okay. And also we want to highlight the spillover effect from TV programs to advertisement or commercials. So for example, we find that a more suspenseful event in a baseball game leads to an increasing attention to the baseball program, uh, but more disruption from the commercials. Okay. So Increasing suspense in the baseball game might be better for baseball programs, uh, but for the advertisers, it might not be good. Okay, so there is a spillover effect between games and commercials. And on the other hand, a surprising event in a baseball game leads to little impact on viewing and attention for the game, but actually we find it, enhan it enhances attention to commercials. So uh, some of the results are consistent with the previous uh, papers, uh, but we want to highlight that when we design the program contents or when we think about when to have commercial advertisements, we need to take into account the potential spillovers between uh, programs to attention, uh, so commercials. So that's the kind of key contributions uh, we are aiming to. Um, maybe I can pause here uh, if you have any question. Um, Perfect. So there's one question from Luis Cabral. Uh, Luis, I'll just unmute you and then you can ask it. Yeah. Okay, my question is very simple in terms of uh, uh, contribution and related literature and so forth. I was immediately uh, taken to uh, Surprise and Suspense, uh, the Eli Kimerick and uh, I forget the third author. So yeah. I was just, and they also use very disaggregated data if I recall. So I was very curious as to how your paper is going to relate to that, uh, both in terms of the conceptual framework and in terms of the results. Yeah, basically our suspense and surprise definition measurement is coming from uh, Eli Kamenica, uh, Eli Frankel Kamenica paper. So we use the same definition of suspense and surprise. Uh, but like I said, we have disaggregate data about viewing and attention, the passive and active way of viewing uh, watching TVs. And we want to highlight that how suspense and surprise affect differently to um, viewing and attention. So that's the kind of key difference. And also we have uh, not only the TV, pro TV programs, but also we have commercial information. So we can see the potential spillover impacts uh, of that. So theoretically, suspense and surprise are uh, coming from the JP paper. Great, thanks. And um, let me just ask one question myself. Um, so I, I was thinking about the quality of the teams and the quality of the competition as, as a whole basically affecting, you know, that's an important margin that's also <clears> discussed <throat> by sports leagues or uh, like, especially MLB. Um, right. So is that something that you're thinking about or, or, or is that, or, or is that like, uh, 
I, I definitely agree. And I think that's important you know, margin that we should take into account. We have some you know, game fixed effect in analysis that partially takes you know, uh, accounts for the importance of each game. Um, but I think um, you know, that's what we you know, kind of try to control for that. And there's one more question from uh, Larry White. So Larry, let me just unmute you. Okay, got it. Um, just I was just uh, struck by your last uh, sub bullet on this slide. It, it's not clear to me what the mechanism is that links a surprise to the commercial message, even though it doesn't affect the viewing and attention to the program itself. That, that, that's not immediately obvious to me. Yeah, uh, in, a, in a paper, uh, you know, we have some psychological explanations, uh, you know, how surprise leads to the destruction, uh, so more attention to commercials. Uh, you know, one you know, mechanical thing some people said is that after the surprising event, people want to see the kind of reviews of replay of events or things like that, and then they you know, stay paying attention to the screen and things like that. That's one kind of mechanical way to explain this, um, that spillover effect. Uh, but I, you know, we cannot really disentangle different mechanisms, but another, uh, I think we can also think about some psychological mechanism behind that. I, so I, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't have the result about the psychological mechanism here, uh, but yeah. that's what we, how we can explain the results. Okay. Great. Thanks, Kazuka. There, there are no more questions right now, so you can uh, continue. All right. Yeah, so let me talk about the data. Uh, so first of all, the main part, main data is coming from, the main data about TV viewing data is coming from TVGen Insights. The company is based on in both in Boston and in Tokyo. And for this study, we are using the Japanese data. Uh, for another study, actually, we are looking at the presidential debate data. For that study, we are using the uh, US data. But for this paper, we are looking at the uh, Japanese data. Uh, in Japan, the company recruited, recruited about 900 uh, households, including 1,500 people uh, across the prefectures in Japan. You might be worried about some sample selection. Uh, what I can say is they closely follow uh, Nielsen's way to recruit people. So they try to make the sample as represented as possible, uh, but uh, maybe some you know, concerns about sample section uh, we acknowledge. Basically what the company does is they put the device on top of TV screen. And this device has facial recognition system based on a, a deep learning algorithm. So this facial recognition system identifies each member in a household, each member, so mother and dad, mom and dad, things like that. And also the device identifies eyes, whether eyes are actually looking at the screen or not, okay? whether eyes are screen, looking at the screen or not. That identifies attention. And not only uh, people are in front of the TV, uh, but whether people are actively paying attention to the screen or not. Okay? That's our attention measure. Um, on top of that, the company actually collects some emotion information uh, like she looks happy and he looks sad and things like that. Uh, but unfortunately, because of some privacy concerns, uh, we are not allowed to use some emotion uh, data. But the company probably internally uses it. So basically for, uh, for each individual, for each second, we can collect the following three measures, uh, W, V, and E. And w is whether or not TV is on or off. V is TV is on, and condition on that, whether the person is in front of TV or not. That's V, that we call viewing. And condition on viewing, whether or not the person's eyes are actually paying attention to the screen or not, that's E, that's attention measurement. Okay. So we have W, V, and E, three measures. And based on the conversation with the company, this V measure, viewing measure, is closely related to you know, what Nielsen measures uh, in the TV rating data. Okay. So V is a kind of a really traditional measurement and E is uh, probably a more precise way of measuring customer's engagement, attention. Okay. Um, unfortunately, because of some NDA restrictions, I cannot show the raw data uh, of V and E, 
uh, here. But like what I can say here is there is a huge discrepancy between V and D. Conditional on, I'm sitting in front of the TV and TV is on, only 30% of the time people are actively paying attention to the screen. Okay? So less of the time people are watching you know, smartphones or tablets, uh, not really paying attention, engaging into the TV programs. Okay? On top of that, we have TV programs and commercial information. Okay? And for this paper, uh, so we have some information about brands and companies for each commercial. And for this paper, we're going to focus on the sample uh, who are tuning in the baseball game at least a wait one minute for uh, for the game. And we supplement this viewing and attention data with the baseball game detailed baseball game data. And the reason why we're going to focus on the baseball games uh, is that you know the baseball is one of the most popular professional sports in Japan. So, Actually, the most popular sports in Japan, the second is soccer and the third is sumo wrestling, of course. Um, the, because of this popularity, uh, TV stations regularly broadcast broad, uh, baseball games, and there are a lot of people watching baseball games. Okay? And second, and most important, uh, more importantly, uh, baseball game for baseball games, it is relatively easy to you know, summarize what's happening in a game. It is relatively easy to summarize game contents and status in a kind of low dimensional state space, okay? like you know, innings, outs, bases loaded, score differences, et cetera. Those are kind of relatively easy to measure in the data. You know, if you look at soccer or basketballs, it's not easy to summarize what's happening in the game. Right? There are many players moving together in the same way. So it's not really easy to summarize in a low dimensional state space, but for the baseball games, um, the state space is well-defined and I think uh, it's kind of low dimensional. So it's easier to handle. You know, outside sports like drama or documentaries, it's even harder to come up with how to summarize what's happening in the TV contents. Okay. And also there is a rich heterogeneity across games. Uh, some games are really boring, some games are really interesting. So we can use that heterogeneity to identify uh, their preference on uh, the suspense and surprise. Okay. Right, so the baseball data is coming from data stadium that collects all professional sports in Japan and we used the baseball game data uh, in 2018. Okay. The nice thing about this data is that we have pitch by pitch information uh, and timestamp of each event. So we can easily match uh, each event in a baseball game to the attention data. So that's, uh, that's easy. Uh, in the data, we have about like a 900 games, 877 games. And among 877, uh, only 41 games uh, were broadcasted. So those 41 uh, games, we can match the baseball game data to the attention data. Okay? And about for 900 games, we can use these 900 games to summarize what's happening in the game to estimate suspense and surprise. Okay? So that, that's what I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Okay. I have a quick clarification question. Sure. Uh, so I guess the more competitive games are more likely to be selected for broadcast, or is it games by, you know, like the, the Tokyo Giants or something like that that are more <laughs> likely to be selected for broadcast? Is that, you know, is, that is that what yeah, it is? That's right. So one team, exactly like you said, Tokyo Giants uh, were owned by one of the TV stations. So that team is, you know, mainly broadcasted. And of course, some playoff, playoff games are uh, mostly broadcasted. So I think I agree that there is some selection about uh, what kind of, which type of games are more likely to be broadcasted. Uh, some descriptive, anal uh, descriptive analysis. Uh, here, this is a score difference on X axis and the viewing and attention on Y axis. As you can imagine, as the score difference increases, the viewing and attention decreases. So the, the average viewing is the highest when the game is a tie. Uh, the average attention also has a similar pattern, uh, but it's not, it's not exactly the same. Right? The average attention is the highest when the score difference is one, not a tie. Okay? But basically, you know, the attention and the viewing move in the same direction, but not exactly the same way. So that allows us to identify the effect of, uh, let's say, score difference on viewing and attention differently. <clears throat> And in terms of innings, x-axis innings and y-axis viewing and attention, we see that 
later innings, uh, sixth, seventh, eighth innings, have higher viewing and a higher attention. Uh, but in the ninth inning, we see a huge drop in viewing and in and also attention. Well, this is probably because you know once people tell the results of each game, people stop watching and viewing. So there is a huge drop in viewing and attention in seven uh, ninth innings. Okay. Right. Um, so now I'm gonna uh, dive into a more detailed analysis about the data. Um, so maybe this is a good time to pose, um, take some questions if you have any. Yeah, so there's just one question from Larry about uh, why so few games are broadcast. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't have clear explanation about that. Uh, there are more local channels that broadcast you know, less popular programs, uh, but yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> Well, one reason probably, you know, even though I said baseball is the most popular prof professional sports in Japan, you know, soccer is gaining popularity. So uh, TV stations broadcast more soccer games or sumo is kind of coming back. <laughs> so maybe the market share of baseball is declining a little bit uh, because of soccer and sumo. And there's also a quick clarification question from Unati Naran. Yeah. Uh, so it, actually, let me just uh, let me just try to find you and unmute you. Uh, Thanks, Daniel. My clarification was more about so I'm not a big sports fanatic, so I just wanted to understand. Typically, in a live broadcast, suspense and surprise events would unfold as the game glow goes on, but I. I'm wondering if the ads have to be decided in advance, how does that factor in? Can advertisers figure that out real time or networks figure that out real time? Thank you. Yeah, so some commercials are predetermined. Like most of the advertisements are between innings. Right? Between innings, nothing happened in the baseball game. So that's the timing typically the TV stations have commercials. Uh, but uh, there are some fraction of advertisement uh, that uh, inserted in the, during the inning that's kind of happening in real time. When nothing happened, like the pitcher is changed, uh, some players on the, on the field is changed, then there is nothing gonna, uh, on the field, then probably that's a good timing to have commercials. And there is some real time component here, uh, but I think a large part of commercials uh, are predetermined. And just w one last uh, question from Michael Ward, whether you know whether if the viewer is in the team, is in the city of the teams that are playing? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we don't know, you know, which team each viewer is supporting. And that's a very important and I think interesting variation, but unfortunately we don't know. And we know the location, but I'm not sure, uh, you know, Tokyo Giants, that's the most popular team and I think uh, across all professionals in Japan, many people support the most popular team. So anyway, so I'm not sure uh, that variation is useful, but I, yeah. Uh, so, so that's, a, you have about uh, 17 minutes officially, but we'll, no. we'll let it go a little longer just because yeah. uh, I just <laughs> have a few questions. Yeah, no, yeah. no worries. Yeah, so maybe I should uh, a little bit speed up. So uh, using this baseball data, now we're going to calculate and estimate suspense and surprise from baseball data. And like uh, Luis asked before, our definition of suspense and surprise are coming from uh, a seminal paper by uh, Ali Frankel Kamenica, 2015 JPE. This is the same you know, theoretical paper about Bayesian persuasion, uh, but they have a, a, a empirical part in which they calculate suspense and surprise for various events like tennis, presidential elections, things like that. We closely follow their definition of suspense and surprise. And also I think this definition of suspense and surprise were also tested uh, in psychology in laboratories. So I think uh, our definition of suspense and surprise are not really a terrible definition of suspense and surprise. Okay. So uh, let me introduce a notation, mu gt. So we assume a rational Bayesian uh, uh, viewer who has mu gt, this is a prior belief about the home team, in, home team winning probabilities. What is the chance that home team is going to win given the all information available at time t? Using the all information available at time, at time t, what is the chance that the home team is going to win this game? And that's the mu gt prior belief. 
And based on this mu gt, suspense is defined in this equation. This is basically the standard error, the variance of what's going to happen in the next period, so mu gt plus one. And what's going to happen to the next period, the variance and the standard, standard deviation of that event is the suspense. So this is the example measure of how uncertain I think okay, the chance of home team winning uh, is going to change given the all information available at time t. Okay, so that's the extent measure of what's going to happen to the game. That's the suspense. And surprise, this is the difference between mu g t and mu g t minus one. Okay, so this is exposed measure uh, about what happened to the game. So this is a, a surprise. And we're going to use suspense and these measures of suspense and surprise. And other empirical papers uh, using suspense and surprise also use similar or same definition of suspense and surprise. Okay. Uh, using, we can estimate this mu gt using the baseball data because we assume rational Bayesian uh, viewer. The mu gt, this is the probability that home team is going to win given ST, state variables of time t. The state variables of time t includes BO, this is basis loaded and out counts, innings, head or bottom or score difference. You know, using those information, state variables, we can predict what is the chance that home team is going to win this game. That's mu GT. Okay. So we can develop a predictive model, this left hand side, to calculate the prior belief mu GT from the baseball game data. So we train the predicted model using XG boost using all 877 games, not only the game 41 games broadcasted, but also all other uh, remaining games, uh, about 900 games in 2019, to train this uh, predicted model. Okay. Our prediction accuracy is about 80%, so I think it's fine. Um, and we also estimate the state transition probabilities. So state transition of ST plus 1 given ST. We can also estimate this. To calculate, to calculate suspense and surprise. Okay. So we train the music T from the data and the state transitions. We can calculate suspense and surprise for each for each game and for each minute. Okay. So this is how like suspense and surprise move for two games. This is kind of boring game in two, so April two thousand nineteen. Um, this yellow bar, yellow chart, this is a score difference. And for this game, the away team scores two, two points at the beginning and then three more points in the middle. And after that, you know, uh, basically the away team is always winning. So the home team winning probability is very low and nothing happens. So suspense and surprise are almost flat. Away team is going to win anyway. But the right game here, September 2019, this is a more exciting game. So nothing happened. Both teams do not score until the last minute. The score is zero. But in the last inning, the home team gets uh, two scores and the home team is uh, one. So, but in, during the game, there are many things happen. So the home team winning probability change and the fluctuate. And because of that, both suspense and surprise fluctuate a lot during the game. Okay? And when the home team gets two scores, the surprise jumps, sorry. Uh, surprise jumps up and the suspense also jumps up. So this is how the suspense and surprise evolve during the game uh, uh, in response to the home team winning probabilities. Right. Um, maybe I don't have so much time to let me skip some descriptive analysis, but uh, and now using this you know, suspense and surprise data and attention data, we're going to estimate a choice model to see what are the driving forces of viewing behavior. Okay. So the actions here, they have three variables. Zero, if the person is tuning away from baseball game. Okay. So the TV is off or the person is watching different uh, programs, not baseball games. If it takes one, if the person is watching but not paying attention to the screen. So we say this is low attention. And y is equal to two if the person is watching and also actively paying attention to the screen. So this is high attention. Okay. This is the outcome variables. And we simply estimate a multinomial logic model using, uh, using suspense, surprise, commercial dummy, and so customer demographics, age and gender, 
and gameplay variables like score difference and innings or uh, uh, play of games or uh, batting orders, those kind of gameplay variables, those are DJT. Okay, so using these variables, we can estimate multinomial logic models. Of course, we have uh, done a lot of robustness checks, uh, including more variables, or we tried nested logic model or order logic model. We can allow time dependency in watching behavior. Uh, we can also think about more structural, you know, dynamic uh, uh, kind of model. That's kind of computationally hard. <laughs> so we kind of prefer to use the simple multinomial logic model for now. But if you have any uh, suggestions and ideas, uh, I'm happy to hear your opinion. Okay. So uh, I think I have a lot of questions, but maybe uh, I can hold those questions. No, I think that there's a bit of a discussion going. Uh, it's okay. I think your co-authors are handling uh, some of the Thank more you. clarification questions in the, Thank in you. the chat. So let me talk about, about the results and also some kind of actual results. So this is a multinomial logic results without any interactions. There are no heterogeneity. So the right left panel here, this is y equal one, low attention. The right, right panel here, this is high attention, y is equal to two. So one and one, these are the same model. And the two, the second, the second column and the fifth column, two, these are the same model. Okay. So we find that uh, for low attention, the effect of suspense and surprise are kind of mixed. Sometimes sometimes negative, sometimes positive, sometimes not significant. So for the low attention, suspense and surprise are kind of mixed, but for high attention, y is equal to two, people paying attention to the screen, we find that both suspense and surprise have positive and statistical significant coefficients. Okay. Well, that's the first finding. And also female always have negative coefficients. So they pay less attention for both levels to the baseball games. Okay, the commercial is also negative and it's statistically significant. So people get disrupted uh, by commercials. Okay. And post season, we have more attention uh, for both levels. Okay. So this is just marginal effect. And I think more interesting results uh, is here when we allow interactions and heterogeneity. Okay. So here we have more richer specifications. There are two slides uh, allowing interactions with suspense and surprise and demographics and gameplay variables. Okay, so let me first focus on the interactions between suspense and surprise and demographics. Okay. So by themselves, suspense is positive for both low attention and high attention, uh, but surprise is by themselves, by itself, surprise is not really statistically significant. Okay. But I think more interesting finding is uh, here, for example, female and suspense interaction is always negative for both levels and female and surprise interaction is also negative and statistically significant. And so female are less responsive to suspense and surprising events in the baseball games. And this finding is I think consistent with other uh, papers. And also you find older viewers are more responsive to suspense uh, but not for a surprise. This is the interaction between suspense and surprise and the demographics. And in the next slide, we have interaction, the same regression. We have the interactions between suspense and surprise and commercials in post seasons. So uh, we find that suspense and surprise enhance low attention to viewing commercials. During the suspenseful moment or surprising moment, we have commercials, then what's gonna happen? So for the low attention levels, suspense and surprise leads to higher uh, uh, probabilities. Okay. And also for high attention, surprising moment and commercial interaction is positive and statistically significant. Okay. But the suspenseful moment, if we have commercials, the people's active engagement to the screen is going to be smaller. So while surprising, su surprise increases high attentive viewing, suspense inhibits attention to commercials. People do not like having commercials when during the suspenseful moment. Okay. And another thing uh, uh, is here, the interaction between female and the commercial, this is both positive and statistically significant. So I think this is kind of interesting uh, because you know most brands and companies that have commercials during the baseball games, 
is kind of targeting to male viewers, like alcohol, beer, like automobile, things like that. Uh, but this results indicating that female viewers are more likely to paying attention for the commercials during the baseball games. So maybe the companies may want to adjust their targeting strategies uh, for the baseball game viewers, female baseball game viewers. All right, so this is, so I, I have five more minutes and let me talk about the counterfactuals. <laughs> We, we, I mean, we, we can go for, we can go for, you can go for like, let's say seven or eight minutes uh, okay. <laughs> rather than five. Uh. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe I was a bit too, yeah, too fast to explain the results, but I think the counterfactual is more interesting. So let me talk about counterfactuals anyway. Um, so using this estimated multi-normal logic model, now we can think about counterfactual uh, simulations in which we change the rules of baseball games. Okay, so this, you know, this is a list of rule changes that Major League Baseball is currently discussing. And some of them make sense, some of them may not really make sense, uh, but we can do some kind of actuals. And today I can show the results of this uh, point uh, eight, seven inning games. We can shorten the game from nine innings to seven innings. Then what's gonna happen? That's uh, what we can show. And also we are, use, we are trying a mercy roll. We don't have the results yet, uh, but if we have a mercy roll, if we end the game, if one team outscores uh, by like seven points at the end of uh, six innings or seven innings, what's gonna happen? Uh, we haven't done the, we don't have the results yet, but we are working on that. So today we're gonna focus on the seven inning games. So the first thing we're gonna do is using the estimated state transition uh, data, uh, state transition model, we can re-simulate the games if we shorten the game. Okay. That creates counterfactual suspense and surprise. So we don't really chop the game in the data at the seven innings, but we kind of re-simulate what's gonna to happen to the game if we shorten the game. That creates kind of actual suspense and surprise. So in the data, the average suspense and surprise are at 0 0.04 and 0 0.01. But if we shorten the game to the ninth, uh, seventh innings, we see an increase in suspense and surprise. If we shorten the game, the average suspense and surprise are higher than actual data. These are the two same games that I showed before. Uh, so if we chop the game, if we shorten the game, you know, the basic patterns look same, but if you compare the two figures, uh, that's not exactly the same. We see more fluctuations in suspense and surprise, for example, in this more exciting game. Okay? So this is a counterfactual suspense and surprise. This is not exactly the same as the previous uh, figure. So using this counterfactual suspense and surprise, we can re-simulate the people's viewing behavior, paying attention and watching, okay? Right, so this is the counterfactual results. The first column, this is the data. The second column, this is the counterfactual results. And lower tension, this is y is equal to one. Higher tension, y is equal to two. And a uh, total viewing, this is y equal one plus two, or the sum of the two. Okay. Uh, so we also split during the game and during commercials. So first of all, we see that total viewing to the game, total viewing to the game doesn't change so much from 5.97 to 6.03. So 0.06% increase, but it's not that much. Okay. Uh, but total viewing to commercials increases a lot from 3.42 to 5.30. So total viewing to commercial increases a lot, but most of the part from 3.42 to 5.30, the most of the part is coming from low attention viewing. Y is equal to one. Not really a passive viewing to commercials. So 2.8 to 4.47. High attention viewing increase like 0.21, 20, 21% of things like that. Uh, but the majority of the change is coming from the change in low attention viewing to commercials. So what does this tell? The implication of this result is that you know, conditional on viewing, conditional on viewing, the percent of viewers who pay attention to commercial decreases if you shorten the game. Okay. In a, in the data, we have 18% of the people who pay attention to commercials, but in a shortened game, 
we have only like 16%. So the, the, the number decreases quite a bit. Okay. So what this says is that if we shorten the game, we have more people sitting in front of the uh, TV for during commercials. We have more people uh, watching commercials, but the, the, the marginal viewers are not really paying attention to the commercials. Okay. Even though we have more people, those incremental people are not really paying attention to the screen, actively paying attention to the screen. So from the automatic, it's in plain English, uh, fewer viewers step away during commercials if you shorten the game, uh, but more viewers look away from uh, or watching uh, uh, um, smartphones or tablets uh, during commercials. And from the advertiser's point of view, this may indicate uh, that they are overpaying for the additional viewers because they are not really paying attention, even though there are more people, but they are not really paying attention. So we, if we aggregate all games in 2019, we find that the company, if you shorten the game, the advertisers can uh, increase the advertisement revenue by 24.2% because we have more people in front of the, uh, in front of the commercial, in front of the TV during commercials. Um, we can also we can probably also calculate how much the company is overpaying if. The company, if the, the measurement switches from you know, viewing to attention, that's more precise measure. If, we, if the pricing is based on attention instead of viewing, uh, how much the company is overpaying to the commercials, we can also calculate that uh, probably that we, have, we don't have the numbers yet. Um, maybe I'm... I'm I'm running yeah, so, out of so time. So if you just could you just take like a, a minute or two to conclude. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm running out of time. So just no, no, no worries, no worries. The key takeaways of this paper uh, is that we investigate the impact of TV program contents with a special emphasis on suspense and surprise on the viewers' attention and the viewers' uh, viewing and then customer engagement, and we propose the product program design strategies. In this case, we shorten the game or we implement a master role. We can try different uh, role changes. But that's the product design uh, strategies we tried. Uh, we have the unique data about the customers viewing and attention differently. And also we have detailed information about what's happening in the baseball games. So we can match those baseball and attention data to study the program design questions and the uh, advertisement timing question. Um, yeah, so the paper is still ongoing and the, we need to do a lot of things to improve the paper, especially counterfactuals. So uh, if you have any questions or comments, I really, uh, I really appreciate your uh, suggestions and comments. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is all I have. Sorry, I'm running out of time and I kind of. <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks a lot, Kasuke. Um, so now we're done with the, the talk part. Now we're, we're onto the discussion. Um, let me ask Hannes. So Hannes had a question and it was a bit of a discussion in the, in the comment, in the chat. Um, so let me just unmute Hannes and, and then he can ask the question. I think I got two uh, very good answers. Uh, okay. Okay, great. So uh, the next person is uh, Michael Ward. had a had a really interesting question as well. Uh, Michael, I'll just unmute you. Uh, no, I'll just read it then. Uh, how vulnerable you are your counterfactuals to a Lucas critique? That is, the gameplay would change with shorter game, while a role for a relief pitchers, and this might affect the sustainability and surprise. Yeah, sure. I totally agree with it. Um, in a counterfactual, we estimate, you know, we simulate a counterfactual suspense and surprise using estimated UGT and estimated state transitions. Uh, but we kind of implicitly assume that the teams, baseball teams, are not really, you know, radically changing their strategies. But of course, if you shorten the game, it's easy to imagine that players change their strategies and teams are also changing the hiring strategies, et cetera, et cetera. So to the extent that the baseball teams are now, you know, radically changing their strategies overall, uh, I think our results are robust, uh, but we totally agree. We are not really endogenizing the strategies chosen by baseball teams. Uh, yeah. Great, thanks a lot. Um, there, there are no more 
questions in the chat. If anyone has any, oh, there is one. There's one more for Anati. So let me just uh, unmute you. Perfect. Sorry, this is kind of a long question, but I was also thinking in terms of viewers' expectations as they're watching the game. If somebody's a diehard fan, probably they already know kind of what's going to happen and the surprising moments don't really surprise them. Especially when I looked at the super interesting gender results, I was thinking maybe men already know, okay, this, this is how the game's going to go. And they're not super surprised when it happens. And so their attention to the commercial doesn't really go down relative to women. Um, is there a way to factor in that kind of bias? Yeah, that's a, that's a good explanation. We haven't thought about this explanation, uh, but yeah, I, I agree. Uh, this might be a reason that uh, explains the different gender difference. Mm -hmm. I think your data is super interesting. One of the other things you might be able to see from the facial recognition stuff is when people are watching together with somebody else versus when they're watching the game alone. I feel like women might also distract men when they're watching. So you may see some of those joint viewing explanations at play as well in your future extensions. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, definitely we can check if people are watching together or just by themselves. Uh, we have the, you know, the person ID and a household ID. So even though in, within the household we have some variations, so we can we can take a look, uh, but we haven't we haven't done that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Hannes has a question about dynamics. Yes, so I can completely understand why you're using the the static logic model here. Uh, I was still wondering, yeah, to what extent you you thought about this because it seems to be potentially very dynamic context in which I don't know there's some big distraction during the game. Uh, and you cannot, you know, switch your attention back and forth. Uh, that, yeah, that, that, that is right. Uh, and I think we initially started uh, from more structural, dynamic structural model. Uh, the problem of this, you know, static multi-element logic model is even though I'm not really paying attention and watching the basal games, still I know what's happening in the game. I know suspense and surprise. I know gameplay variables in the data. Uh, you know, if I'm not watching, I don't have any data information about that, uh, but we implicitly assume that they know that. So, but we can think about more kind of more structural and realistic uh, uh, expectation evolution. If I'm not watching and, and paying attention to the screen, my belief evolution is only based on, you know, some population distribution, not the actual realizations. And uh, so we have some results about based on this more, you know, dynamic uh, structural model. And the results are kind of consistent with what we found in the main in the multi-domain logic model. But the problem of this dynamic structure model is we cannot really control for a lot of fixed effects or a lot of rich interactions because of computational uh, reasons. So you know we kind of prefer the multi-domain logic model that allows us to have a lot of interactions and the fixed effects. Uh, but we can think about, you know, we can definitely think about more structural model. Actually, we have some slides, you know. Yeah, after this. Uh, but I think that's a very good reason to, to go that way, actually, because I think interactions here are super important. Yes. Yeah, and also the fit of the multinomial logic model is quite good, much better than the structure model. So <laughs> we kind of, you kind of, we kind of debated which model we should go, uh, go for. But yeah, so far, I think we use multinomial logic model. <laughs> So I have another. Uh, so I have another related um, question that's going to make your life harder. Um, <laughs> have, you, have you thought about doing some sort of like a mixed logit model? Because again, I can imagine you know different people have different things that they find boring or surprising. Like I love it, you know, when the Blue Jays are beating the Yankees by like a score of ten or something like that. Like that's my that's my favorite game. Yeah. Uh, but uh, other people may not be enjoying that. Um. Well, you know, in, port, in terms of the, you know, game level heterogeneity, we control for that with the fixed effects for each game. Uh, but I think the... But, but something like unobservable heterogeneity of the, yeah, of the yeah, individuals, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, so like you, you can have like unobservable types, like two, unobser two or three, like if you try to ha include two or three unobservable types or something like that. Yeah, uh, I have tried to estimate the random coefficient model actually. Uh, if, if we allow time dependency, probably we should allow for uh, random coefficients as well uh, to separate the individual heterogeneity and random coefficients uh, identification. Uh, but 
yeah, the computation is a bit hard and we don't have the results yet, uh, but definitely we should try uh, to see if the results are robust. And, and then I, I had a question, um, so, so unless anyone else. Uh, so I also had a question about, you know, some surprises can be good and some surprises can be bad. Uh, so in some sense, your, your, both of your measures don't really have like a direction to them. Um, is there something, is there some way you can, you can do it? Like, um, like if there's an injury or something like that, that's maybe like not, not good, like just like a, like a bad surprise or something like that, right? Like so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So for our measure of surprise is, you know, absolute value. So there is no direction, but I think uh, depending on, you know, home team or white team is at that, uh, we can allow different definition of suspense and surprise. Uh, I think at one point we were using different definitions of surprise, uh, but yeah, we don't have the results. Yeah, I think that's another measure of surprise. Great, thanks. Um, so we don't have any more questions. I, I mean, I, I can keep asking you questions about this because uh, uh, you've really hit, you really nailed my my, my two interests, which is, uh, which is baseball <laughs> and suspense and structural modeling. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so actually, so I have another question related to the construction of the expected wind probabilities. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of the so there's there's ways in which um, you know stand like there's standard ways and like um, that advanced use advanced baseball statistics to calculate expected prob like probabilities of different teams winning like expected runs or or some like like kind of analytics. And I think you can get data on that, and that might actually give you a better fit um, for these for these uh, predict for these probabilities of teams winning. So, sorry, say again. What's the kind of so, the... so there's different. So, so I mean, if you go to like you know, so if you watch a game, I don't know, like on, on MLB.com, it actually does give you like expected win probabilities at different points of the game, and they use these like analytics, like more advanced analytics. I see. Um, based on you know who the players are, what they do, um, that sort of stuff. Um, so perhaps trying to and, and all that data is available, I think. So uh, perhaps you could use uh, that. To... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure if that is available also for the Japanese <laughs> uh, baseball leagues, uh, but but I think our you know construction of state variables. It's actually coming from the baseball analytics. We, I, we talked with uh, you know, some OR people who are studying the baseball uh, <clears throat> uh, strategies. Uh, our, uh, I think, estimation of state transitions and these probabilities are kind of close to, close related to their definition of uh, state, uh, state uh, variables construction. So, not probably not that terrible, but I think we can still improve. Um, and uh, so, just one more qu question from Larry. Uh, so, Larry, uh, whether you can use the tr tr track records. Uh, so, so, can you and yourself? Actually, I'm I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure about the question. Sure. I mean, it's just uh, you know the 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 sports literature, especially on baseball, has developed this uh, kind of um, right prediction model uh, that Daniel Daniel mentioned, but yeah. uh, you know as a simple a way, just looking at the uh, you know, uh, day by day date progressing through the season track record of the teams, and uh, just using their win loss percentages as a rough and ready uh, predictor of uh, you know, the likely likely outcome uh, could be, you know, in, you, you've got those data uh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. you could easily, easily use. Sure, yeah, I, I think that it increases our prediction accuracy. Um, but I think then that we have to kind of simulate the entire series, entire season <laughs> all together. Uh, if that state of variables is one of the state of variables, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's kind of no, hard. <laughs> no, that's not. Come on. Come on. Uh, you know, uh, that's really not, uh, you know, given okay. 
given modern computing uh, uh, capabilities, that's that's a piece of cake. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, D yeah, definitely. I think the, the win and lose records are important part. Great, thanks a lot. So thanks for everyone for asking questions and participating. And thanks a lot to Kasuke um, for, for this great talk on a super interesting topic. Uh, so we're just about out of time. And I guess we'll